Thank you very much and a very good evening. We're here yet again to talk about mobile network attacks and we want to give this talk a somewhat different spin. Instead of focusing on giving out new vulnerabilities and then hinting at how a fix could be and suggesting that somebody else would be responsible for implementing these fixes, we want to look at those later stages of the attack evolution today and um, make sure that we don't keep recreating new results while old ones are not being resolved yet. Rest assured, there'll also be new attacks because um, we, we need to deliver on, on that every year. Um, but we want to make sure specifically um, to make sure to introduce um, some dynamics that help everybody for networks to become more secure. And my primary goal today is to enable all of you to help with that evolution and to do some of the, uh, the research that we've been doing in Berlin so far um, all over the world. So there'll be a couple of tool releases um, and a couple of, of uh, hopefully evolution drivers. Um, in the end, for us security researchers to be successful in making the world better, we need industry. As painful as that sounds, we need somebody to put in a fix. And we haven't been very good about keeping check on those people that need to put in, in fixes for the research that we have been doing over the last couple of years. Um, and we want to complete the picture today um, by talking a little bit about what um, networks have been doing around research in two areas. Um, SIM card attacks, the topic of this year, where networks found themselves in um, a critical situation at risk of, of um, large parts of their subscriber bases to be remotely infected, not in the phone, but in the SIM card. So there has been um, a fruitful discussion with industry and lots of responses, but not enough and much more so around GSM intercept, a topic that probably the, the NSA discussion now moved into everybody's mind again, but one that was really luring for a decade now, that really anybody can intercept your phone calls anytime. And again, here we want to check on the network operators and make sure that um, they are forced into putting in the protection that we deserve. We first discussed SIM card attacks publicly in August of this year, after um, a few months of responsible disclosure. Um, and we found a combination of three vulnerabilities that led to a potentially um, terrible situation for networks. The first um, fragment that we found was um, the ability to send binary text message from one subscriber to really any other subscriber. So networks allow traffic um, that has no place to, to be routed through networks. And there's no such thing as network neutrality in, in mobile networks, of course. Um, there shouldn't be routing internal management application through what basically is um, the, the IP space of the subscribers or the, the phone number space of the subscribers. The second thing we found is that the services that these messages reach on the SIM cards are often badly protected cryptographically. Um, in particular, we were, um, we were finding lots of cards that used DES keys, 56-bit from the 70s, um, that has long been phased out in pretty much any other application. SIM cards still use old keys like that. And thirdly, we found that um, applications you could install through those desk keys can break out of the sandbox of the Java protection parameter and then access all kinds of data on the, on the SIM card that no Java was supposed to access. And combining those three then made for um, a remote SIM cloning vector at massive scale. And networks uh, raced to fix those on at least two of these three layers. They put in filtering so that the, the network, uh, that the SMS messages wouldn't reach the phone anymore. And they upgraded desk keys to triple desk keys. But most networks left it at that without really thinking through the problem and without really understanding the root causes of what made their SIM card so vulnerable. 
So I want to go into the first two categories, since the third one wasn't addressed even until today, and show how the, res the industry response was, um, in large parts, insufficient. And I shouldn't generalize, as I do now, because some network operators have responded very responsibly, but by and large, the networks shrugged us off or put in quick fixes, and then moved on to the daily business of making networks faster and faster and faster, um, but rarely more secure. So let's look at filtering first and what goes wrong with filtering. Um, networks, um, many networks started filtering right around uh, um, the time when we presented this publicly, around Black Hat and the Ohm camp, um, and they put in one specific filtering rule that was, not surprisingly, um, the exact message that we used in the demonstrations at Black Hat and at Ohm to demonstrate this class of vulnerabilities. What didn't I understand though, is how much broader the vulnerability class is. So to, to put this in, in, uh, in a comparison to, um, to, to computer security, if you tell somebody that um, they have a problem in a TCP stack, let's say in their Linux implementation, and you demo it by sending packets to the SSH daemon, the fix that they implemented is to block port 22 not understanding that, of course, this exact same vulnerability is also present on any other exposed TCP service. And there's bunches of, of ways to format a, an SMS to reach the SIM card. Some somehow come out of the standard, others are just fragments of wrong implementations on phones. In particular, some recent Android phones will route pretty much anything to the SIM card. And that's pretty convenient because the SIM card um, will will look at the message and then discard it if it's not properly formatted for a SIM card. Right? So the, the implementer of the Android phone took the easy way. Just put everything to the SIM card. It will decide what it wants and what it doesn't want. Of course, with a phone like that, no level of network filtering, no filtering whatever TCP port um, will protect it, since even normal user messages sometimes get forwarded to the phone. And so the industry response was, was a bit insufficient here um, and we would like to see more, more testing of networks and we'll, um, when we talk about tools, we'll perhaps enable you to do exactly that type of testing. The second um, area where the industry response falls way short of understanding the problem, again generalizing here, um, is the, the configuration of the SIM cards. So we did discuss um, the uh, the, the problem with desk keys, that you can break a 56-bit desk key in a minute or so using a rainbow table, and that, uh, of course, is, is terrible if those services are reachable remotely. And networks then uh, went into their, to look at their configurations, and a lot of them came out saying, um, we made sure that everything is triple DES on our SIM cards or at least a few places that were still, still DES in older profiles, we patched them to now be triple DES. Again, that's, that falls way short of understanding the core issue. Um, and here's a bit of technical background so you can appreciate what's going on in the SIM card. There's a collection of keys, up to 16 key sets, and each key set can have keys for signing, encryption, and so forth. And those keys, they have a specific type, DES or triple DES, for instance, sometimes even AES on very new cards. And then there's applications on the SIM card. And these applications, there's up to 16 million applications identifier. Of course, no 16 million applications fit on a card. So some of these are present on every SIM card. And the application gets to choose which keys get what level of access. And what seemed to have happened in August is that the networks uh, go through this first application, a standard application, and make sure that triple DES keys are required for signature or encryption, or better, even both. Right? And then the DES keys they had, they upgraded to triple DES. However, we find in a surprising large number of SIM cards the following situation. One of the other 16 million applications says, we use this key set but we require none of it. So you send a, a command to that SIM uh, tar specifying this key set, and you're not required to do signatures or encryption. And at that point, it doesn't matter whether you use triple DES or AES or whatever algorithm, this SIM card will accept any command sent to it. Right? And again, that should kind of be an obvious thing to check for when you're already going through your inventory of SIM cards, um, but that 
requires a deeper level of understanding of these attacks um, than the, most operators seem to have um, developed for this issue. Right? So I hope this, this again helps to carry the point um, that to drive the co-evolution of attacks and defenses, um, industry is required to think through the attacks and understand what exactly the attack perimeter is. Um, to, to make sure um, it, it, it gets across um, very visually now, um, I'd like to get Luca to, uh, to demo um, the attack um, as we, we think it's, um, it, it would play out in the real world. And um, just as, as one sentence of introduction, perhaps, this is coming from a very recent SIM card when we picked up when we, when we started playing with the iPhone 5 as fingerprint reader. Uh, it's just a, an, a, an, a US um, SIM card. And um, yeah, Luca, uh, what are you going to do now? Can you switch on his microphone, please? Don't hear my voice. OK. Um, so as Carson said, we, we found these particularly interesting SIM cards. And the last one we found was very recent. It's a nano SIM, and it goes into, a, into an iPhone 5S. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you what can we do um, to bypass the filters that operators have now. So we put it into the phone. I have here um, a BTS that emulates the, the real operator uh, network. Of course, that's a default way to bypass any type of filtering that the real network may be So doing. now that the mobile is connecting. And I'm trying to show you better. Uh, my BTS is sending some SMS. As soon as the, the mobile is close to the, to the BTS uh, and it tries to register, because it, it, it thinks it's the home network, uh, I send my um, um, application. And that is completely um, installed without any warning, anything on the, on the iPhone. Um, um, yeah. I want to show you something here. So this is the first command. And it's a delete because, OK, since I, I installed the application many times, I first delete it, and then I install it again. So this is remote application management yeah. on, a, on a recent SIM card that requires no security whatsoever. You can put in whatever Java software you would like to run on this SIM card. OK, so it finished. Uh, it's a couple of seconds. 10 seconds, I don't know. And now the SIM card is infected with the malware that every five minutes sends the, the current location of the, of the user to um, um, attacker number. Uh, since the iPhone doesn't show anything, uh, I'm going to, to put this SIM card into another phone so you can see it better. And you can also have a proof that it's on the SIM card. not very easy with the nano SIM into a normal phone. <laughs> but, yeah. So this is the other phone. I have a, OK. So uh, So the, yeah. the virus stays with the SIM card independent I'm going of to, the phone. I'm going to turn it on now. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, it registers to, to the home network. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Is it still set to memory? Yeah, it, it did. It did register. Yeah, so we are actually replaying the, the attack again, <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> Oops. Oh, 
Yeah, bear with us. This is a, a complex demo with lots of okay. moving parts. What I can do is delete the SMS. Uh, so is it showing something now? Okay. I just try again. Oh, actually I have a better better idea. So now I stop my fake BTS. Yeah, let it connect to the real network. And I let it connect to the real network. Okay. Let's see. You're, you're confident the virus got deployed the second time? It, mm, that's actually a nice, oh. nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that was. A well, let, let, let's come back to you in a couple of minutes then, when you when you prepare this. But um, everybody got the idea roughly, right? What, what should have happened? Um, he he's catching the phone or any of your phones really. Um, he he can test for vulnerabilities by just sending SMS. Bunches of them, not 16 million. He has to prepare a little bit, know where vulnerability could be. Um, and then once he finds an unprotected application, he just sends a bunch of, of binary SMS and combine their Java file. And that Java file installs on the SIM card. And it stays installed on the SIM card. And it will, every five minutes, send to current location via SMS to his number or do any other thing that an that the Java on the, on the SIM card is allowed to do. Could even now try to exploit uh, the other parts of the SIM card through that unpatched Java vulnerability that a lot of the SIM cards still have. Installing the virus again? It's installing again. Yeah, this was just the, the best case we found. So you can actually install an application inside, inside the SIM. Uh, in case this is not available, another choice is just reading the, the current uh, ciphering key from the, from the SIM. Yeah, so there, there are a lot of these applications. Okay, so this was the message I was waiting for. So this, this older Nokia phone, um, as the only phone we ever found, ask whether you allow your SIM card to send anything back to the attacker. If I the iPhone just does it by default without asking you every five minutes. Yes. Can you give Oh, it's a bit small there. I tried to copy Did it. you want to show more, Luca? Yeah, I, I mean, the phone now sent the SMS to me, and I want to show how it looks like. So, um, no. Something like this? Mm, no. Uh, I want to enlarge this. So, in this, in this little field, there is the current network and location area and cell ID. So, basically, it's a very precise. Uh, location information about the user. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the best is that this message is not filtered by the operator because it's a normal text SMS. Yeah. So it goes through. So p persistent virus on, on a modern SIM card. I think that's, that's what was needed to, to, to give the industry another nudge to um, deeply understand this. Now, to, um, to create some further nudges from you all um, and to fulfill that goal that I stated going in to enable everybody to do the, these tests um, yourself, uh, we want to release today a tool that condenses all the, the SIM card knowledge that we collected over the last couple of years. Um, and so it's a, an open source tool um, it, written in Java. That was the easiest to, to speak to SIM cards with. Um, and it tests for all the vulnerabilities we, 
uh, we discussed in August, including things like triple desk downgrade, which again, a lot of operators seem to not have understood quite yet. Um, but it also detects these, these more um, recent vulnerabilities. Now, scanning these 16 million possibilities on a SIM card and each of the 16 keys for them, um, that takes a long time on some older, slower SIM cards, up to two weeks. So one thing the tool does is um, pre-select um, these tasks smartly. So it only takes a couple of minutes. It does run on a normal smart card reader, PCSC interface, as well as the Osmocom phone, awesome open source project also. We patched it a little bit to now act as a smart card reader. So of course, it, it can communicate with a SIM card. So if you have any of those, a uh, PCSC reader or an Osmocom phone, and just a couple of minutes of time, download the software and please run the tests, make sure that you're not affected. And if you are, be very vocal to your network operator and demand that these things get removed. Thank you. Um, looking at similar technology um, or similar weaknesses, let's revisit the topic of GSM intercept. And I'll again try to, to make the point that um, networks maybe casually be interested in uh, fixing some bugs that they may not have fully understood, so they only did have to fix this or not at all. Um, and again, I think this is, this is of, of high urgency, understanding now how many people are intercepting our phone calls. Network operators are supposed to, to protect us on all the frequencies we use. And while 3G and 4G bring pretty OK cryptography with longer key lengths, um, most of our calls still go over 2G. Um, this standard from the 80s. It's the only technology that can cover large areas, and even uh, in, in cities where, where the cell sizes don't have to be so large, um, these frequencies have to get used because all frequencies are full. We have a frequency scarcity, so 2G frequency uh, certainly is still used by everybody almost every day. And on 2G, there are two different encryption standards that are found in the wild. There's A51, the, the, the first encryption cipher, the one that was originally invented along with GSM back in the 80s. And then there's A53, a 10-year-old encryption standard um, that's supported by um, newer phones. I would say about half of the phones in, in current use support this A53 cipher, where the other ones will always default to A51. Hence, a network would have to support both of them in a secure way or as secure as possible way um, to sufficiently protect their customers. Let's uh, visit each of them uh, in turn. Um, to break A51 with tools like the ones we released some five years ago now, um, you have to have um, some attack surface. So it's not enough to have a tool that can break um, an A51 packet, you also need to know what's inside the A51 packet. So for one of all these packets, you have to predict the content, you break the key from it, and then you can decrypt the rest of them as well. Right? So you got to start somewhere to then break the rest of it. And um, I believe no spy agency would have a better way of, of breaking A51 over the air. They also have to rely on, on some attack surface. So if everything is unpredictable, it basically becomes XORing random numbers. Right? Um, and the, the GSMA and later the three GPP, those standardization bodies um, that that try to make the, the, the mobile world a little bit more secure. Um, they worked hard some five years ago to, um, to amend standards for this attack surface to go away. So in a standard trace, as, as we still see it in too many networks, pretty much everything that's encrypted is predictable, at least in the call setup. Right? So um, the, the phone starts. Uh, unencrypted, it receives a ciphering mode command, um, and it will, uh, it will then uh, encrypt every single packet um, it, it sends, and also expect the packets it receives to be encrypted, including some that actually make sense, where, where it says, here, you phone with that Timsy, please have another Timsy, but also things are encrypted that carry no content whatsoever, like a null frame. That just says the network is supposed to speak now, but it has nothing to say. 
but also things with static content, like these system information me messages. This exact same message was sent maybe a second earlier unencrypted. And once it's, it switches on encrypted, uh, encryption, the phone expects this also to be encrypted. And then there's, there's messages with very little content, and again, null frames, things that, that basically have no meaning whatsoever, assignments to certain frequencies. There are not very many frequencies to choose from, so this is mostly predictable. And all of this is to be considered a tech surface. And there are two standards. Padding randomization, which takes shorter messages and demands random bytes, and SL5 randomization, which takes longer messages but um, scrambles their content, that remove this attack surface almost entirely. The little bit of attack surface that's left um, is due to, to vendor-specific communication, and this needs to be fixed vendor by vendor. But by just putting in those two standards, um, A51 calls should be protected um, from at least tools that we can think of. Um, now, given that this is f five years ago that these were standardized and that there is a lot of pressure um, on, on security these days, um, you would imagine that these fixes, just tiny software fixes, would be deployed thoroughly. However, we rarely see networks that do either of them, and we've never seen a network that does both these fixes. So somewhere along the way, between the GSMA and 3GPP who write the standards, and you as a customer, that idea got lost. And it's, it's not a difficult idea to throw in some random numbers instead of static values, or to take a message and, and, and scramble its content. These things should be pretty straightforward to be implemented. And we've seen both ideas in the wild. So there's proof that at least some vendors have implemented these features. However, the networks do not seem to be using them at all. The same attack surface, then, would open up for A53 if somebody had a much bigger computer to decrypt it. And by much bigger, I mean about a million dollars. So A53 is now 10 years old. And 10 years ago, it seemed like a great idea to take a 64-bit stream cipher and make a 64-bit uh, block cipher out of it. You don't have to mess with the key generation or anything. It becomes much more secure. And in fact, it did, two million times more secure. But guess who's going to spend a million dollars to break your A53 encrypted call this year, right? And not just that one agency. Every agency has a spare one million dollar to, to build an A53 cracker. So industry took 10 years to implement this standard. And now that they do, in Germany, for instance, two networks just started this past month to roll out A53. Now it's already outdated. Right? Guess what? The next standard was developed five years ago again. A54, it's called. It blows up the key size to a good 128 bit. It steals that from the 3G part of the SIM card. But every SIM card these days is a 3G SIM card. So somehow we're always 10 years behind the, the state of the art in cryptography and, t and 10 years behind what even industry describes. Uh, prescribes themselves to implement, right? And we want that to change. And again, we, uh, we want you to help us change that by creating awareness around where networks put in what type of countermeasures. It's not enough for them to standardize padding randomization and SI5 randomization. It's not enough for them to, to specify A53 and A54. They actually need to deploy it. And here's three tools you can use to create some visibility. Um, the first two we're releasing today, and the, the third one has always been available. There's just an, um, an incremental patch from us today. First one runs on, on an Android phone, and it allows you to, to record network traces. Those network traces, of course, tell you what type of encryption is used, whether keys get, get rolled over, whether your identity gets, uh, your, your temporary identity gets changed regularly, and so forth. The second tool is basically the same running on a Linux computer. If, if you want to have the data for further analysis um, with the X Goldman tool, um, Tobias Engel's tool. Um, and then the third possibility to acquiring the same data, not just for your own phone, but for basically everybody in a cell you're connected to, is that Osmocom BB open source project. Um, Sylvain put in a lot of work a few years ago 
um, and created this burst in branch. We extended it just a little bit to run much more stable and to really help as a capturing tool. So any of these tools now helps you to, to look at what configurations your network is using and then perhaps interpret this yourself um, and, and to, to check whether they're using the latest encryption and whatnot. We'd much appreciate if you, if you shared um, some of that information uh, with us, and we could then um, again help others by sharing this first and interpreting the information. And um, to make that even easier, um, we put all these tools in a, in a live ISO that you can put on a USB stick and, and boot through with it. So that has all the tools on it, these network uh, measurement tools, it has the SIM tester on it, it has all the stuff on it, catcher, catcher, to, to find IMSI catchers in your vicinity. Um, and it has an option to, to send data to a website called GSM Map. And along with all these tools, we're releasing today um, a new version of the GSM Map website. Um, much more colorful than before, but also much more usable, we hope. So here's the new GSM Map. Um, and this now uh, com interprets a lot of network traces that uh, many of you collected over the, the, the last couple of years with, uh, with Sylvain's um, burst in setup. Um, and for those countries um, where we have a little bit of data, we do estimates, these are the, the, the striped countries uh, here, and for those uh, networks where we have a lot of data, um, we, uh, we try to track the, the network security over time. Okay? So this, for instance, are the four German networks. Um, and you see how over time they actually do change the security setting. T-Mobile, for instance, the, the high flyer here, um, they had a, a big drop in, um, in network security um, intercept, this is, um, by switching off some of the randomization earlier this year. But then uh, after they did that, they started rolling out A53. So somehow they're, they're trading in uh, security features one for the other. Um, and this now on an aggregate level um, tells you how, how secure net your network currently is um, against intercept, basically you know, spy agencies um, listening into your calls, it's impersonation, that is other people using your phone identity to conduct some transactions, and against tracking, that is somebody following your, your whereabouts by electronic means, basically information exposed through, through HLR queries remotely. And you see how networks differ in these categories. Um, this map, by the way, is, is uh, where contributions came from. So a lot of these, of course, are collected uh, by, by us in Berlin. Um, but thank you so much to all of you who send in all these traces from all, all these places that none of us have ever been to. So it's, it's absolutely fabulous to see uh, what coverage we, we gained here. Um, there's still a lot of uh, uh, striped and, and white countries, so we hope to complete the Picture, but uh, we need everybody's help. And hopefully with the tools um, we, we released today, um, it becomes so much easier to, to push data up here um, that this will soon be uh, filled a lot more. Now for those countries where we have a lot of data, and that is 27 um, countries total, we are releasing um, detailed reports today also um, uh, that, that interpret um, these measurements and, and um, rank the networks, but also explain a little bit of, of, of how we measure these things, but then give you detailed technical measurements on uh, what encryption is used, for what, what, what types of transactions are authenticated and so forth. Um, so, thank you. So if, if your country is one of the 27, we'd love if you read the report. Um, if it isn't, we'd love for you to download uh, the tools and, and make sure we can publish a report next month. So this will be refreshed uh, every month, hopefully forever, um, or until every network fulfills every security goal imaginable and then we'll shut down our website. Um, <laughs> So that's, um, that's GSM Map, the, the new website, um, and you, you saw all, all the tools um, uh, that are available now. Um, you may notice that the GSM Map does not yet have a security metric on SIM cards, just because our, our measurements are 
uh, too sparse to, to paint a, a good picture. Would like to you know, start, start calling out the networks that do bad SIM card security. Um, but again, we, we need your help to scan your SIM cards and to make sure that we get some fair comparison among all the networks. Just as a heads up, we found about in every other network where we have a lot of SIM cards to test um, vulnerabilities like the ones we, we discussed today. So there should be a, a good chance if you have a couple of SIM cards at home to find at least a few that are actually vulnerable. And if you do, you can start installing Java on them and, and playing around with them. Right? Um, all right. Um, so um, that, that, what, that was everything uh, we wanted to discuss. Uh, a round of, of thank you, uh, in particular to, to Lukas and Linus, who, has, who have put in uh, many months of, of really hard work to get these tools ready for release today. And they're just about ready uh, this morning uh, after many months of, of, of working on them. So thanks to them, but thanks to everybody else also who were involved. There's just a long list of people who contributed a month or two of work. Um, thanks to the Open Technology Fund for, for sponsoring this research and for helping us um, fight bad security in the world and raising awareness around where, where bad, bad security is, is implemented. Um, yeah, and thank you to all of you for using our tools to take this research to places that we could not have imagined. Thanks. Thank you very much, Carsten and Luca. So we have quite some time left. So as always, if you have questions in, this, in the room, please line up behind the four microphones on the ground floor. If you, have questions from, if you have questions from the web or if you have questions on the streams, please write them on Twitter or on IRC and we will ask them here live in the room. And I think we'll start with two questions from uh, the internet, please. One, one, one quick... Okay. Uh, um, uh, wait, please. Yeah. One, one, one quick heads up before uh, um, the first people start leaving. If you're interested in playing with the tools or at least seeing them being played with, there's a workshop that, that will start um, at 6 in uh, Saal D. Um, so if you want to, to see the live ice and all its component, um, and, or perhaps take a USB stick home, we brought plenty. Uh, to play with. Uh, Zalde is where we'll meet you in a few minutes. But, sorry, go, go ahead with the questions. Okay, two questions from the internet now. Mm -hmm. So first one, um, there are still many low-hanging fruits. Uh, so uh, what about SS7 networks? Did you investigate them and their way of communicating with each other? Can you tell us anything about what happened in the industry in the last year there? Um, sure, yeah. As SS7 is another um, decade-old technology that was built with a wrong threat model. Basically, everybody who connects to the network is trusted, but you have to connect to every other telco in the world to route calls to them. So there's some disagreement and, in the threat model. Um, and people find SS7 vulnerabilities wherever they look, um, both in, in the configuration, stuff like you know, the, SIM filter, the SMS filtering. Um, this, the same kind of topics come up in, in SS7, where, of course, you want to you block um, unneeded traffic, and networks are really bad at that, um, typically. But also, people find implementation bugs on, in boxes that are connected to SS7, and those are really, really hard to research. The boxes are very expensive, so you can't just research it in isolation, and everybody who is running a box like that will probably put you in jail if you ever attempted to, to break them, right? If you ever started to do some fast testing on them. Um, so SS7, unfortunately, um, isn't really prime for open research. Um, it actually requires what I showed on the first slide, kind of a co-evolution, where the networks let the hackers in so that they then learn what other hackers could have done to them. And I don't see many networks to be ready for that yet. Um, so definitely a topic with lots of low-hanging fruit, um, but no easy way to research it. OK, thank you. Uh, should I go on with the second one? Yes. Okay. Um, then, has there been any testing using parallel application only SIM card overlay to block apps on the primary SIM card? Uh, so, that's probably a strange question, but the Muvuku project is mentioned here. Or did you investigate any other simple way to block the Java card bits? So, I, I think I understood the question as is, is an easy way of putting in a, a little other layer of protection just in front of your SIM card? 
Mm -hmm. I guess if we can't ask the person asking the question, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But if that were the question, then the answer is, of course, you can put all kinds of proxy stuff in between your phone and your SIM card. There's a nice open source project called SimTrace. But that then means you, you carry a little computer next to your phone whenever you use it. And of course, that's impractical. So that would be a forensic tool, perhaps, to, to investigate what people are currently doing to your SIM card when you already have a suspicion that something is going on. But there's no practical um, way to get a phone um, to, to give you that level of access. Even on Android, um, the part of the, the operating system or of the system that speaks with the SIM card is usually more baseband than Android or at the very least a proprietary device driver type. Um, so I can't, I can't think of any usable phone that, where you could easily implement an, uh, a SIM card firewall, for instance. Right? But I'd love to learn about them if, if they do exist. OK, we take a question from microphone number four. Uh, did you investigate any upstream vulnerabilities to the, or to the baseband or to the average phone OS? So, if, for instance, if you if you have uh, infiltrated the SIM card, can you do any stuff to an I, uh, to an iPhone or something? Hmm, good question. And no, we haven't. Um, and um, I wouldn't think that 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 would be the most fruitful vector because the interface between a SIM card and a phone is pretty defined, um, very narrow channel. Um, so I think that. Uh, a phone baseband is much easier exploited like Ralph did it a couple of years ago, emulating a network and then sending commands there because that interface is much wider and there's many more protocols running that could potentially be exploit targets. Good question though, thank you. Okay, number three please. Hi. You showed the map uh, broken down by country. Would it make sense to look at smaller districts or regions? Do you have differences within one country, for example the US? That's a good question. And um, we uh, occasionally come across a country where there's uh, configuration differences in different parts of the country. Like, for instance, in Germany right now, two of the network operators are rolling out A53, but they go location by location. So um, there, there's two zones right now. Um, but those are going away over time because the goal, of course, is to implement a security feature everywhere. Um, there are there are networks, though, where they purchase one part of the country from one vendor and another part from another vendor, and where security patches just don't get deployed everywhere. Um, and we'd like to track that more accurately. Currently, it's just averaged. What we need to track it more accurately is constant measurements from more places. So currently, what, what our metric does is it, it tries to fairly combine uh, information from different locations and then average them, uh, even though, for instance, in Germany, of course, Berlin is dominating in our measurement set and um, some other locations, um, I think, thank you, CCC Munich, um, are contributing too, um, but if there were somewhere in the middle of Germany some, some extra security feature, we would not learn about it for a long time. You see this route? This is from last year's trip from, from Hamburg to Berlin when everybody came to the CCC. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we are not distinguishing by country yet, but if the information is ever there to, to see clear border, uh, we'll definitely do that. Okay, a question from number four, please. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask you, showed that you were simulating a BTS uh, somewhere around the middle of the talk. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, uh, were you using any of the known open BTS or Osmo BTS solutions or anything else? Yes. Uh, it's a patched version of OpenBSC. Okay, um, it's just a few lines. Uh, there is a nice function that um, triggers the, um, the software to uh, send the SMS on queue for a user as soon as the user logs in. And as soon as the user does this, I, I put a lot of SMS in the queue okay. so nice. I can send them. Yeah, the, the open. B BSC, OpenBTS, Osmo yeah. Com BB project, they are enormous help in, in our research. We could have done none of this had we had to implement all of this in open source. Um, so they're, they're very, very useful. And thank you for everybody who contributed to them. OK, another question from number four, please. Uh, banks and other organizations love to send one-time tokens uh, via SMS. So, uh, from what I understand the talk, uh, this, it would, would it be in the range of a regular criminal to exploit this and steal those tokens? Um, with, with GSM intercept, yes. You can read other people's SMS when they're AFF1 encrypted. 
Um, however, you have to be close to them in a proximity of, let's say, two kilometers. Um, and it's probably unlikely that the person who infected your online banking um, creden or stole them from your infected computer is also your neighbor. Those two groups don't seem to, to overlap in locations. Um, with the SIM card vulnerabilities, though, you can do lots of stuff. You can send SMS, you can redirect calls, you can steal decryption keys. The only thing you can't do is read people's incoming SMS. So banks uh, got lucky there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we have another question from the internet. Yeah, um, so wouldn't it be easier to just reinvent maybe a more nerd-driven mobile network from scratch than to mess <laughs> around with all this industry stuff that has piled up for years now? Well, that's interesting. Things do not really pile up as, as people imagine them. So the, um, uh, w one of the big drivers of, of the OpenBSC project, I understand, was the availability of really cheap base stations. Why were they available? Because people threw them away and replaced them with newer base stations. And they do that every time they add a new technology. So when they added 3G, they threw away the 2G base stations and replaced them with combined 2G, 3G. Same with 4G now. So um, as, um, as 4G is being rolled out all over Germany, everything gets thrown away and replaced. There isn't so much legacy in terms of installed boxes. The legacy is more the protocol. So if you throw away one, uh, one end of the connection and not the other, you maintain the, the old protocol, but then when you throw away the other side, you again maintain it because it's just the, the kind of the logical legacy. Um, so I, I don't think there's an easy fix to that. This is just very... Uh, high scalability engineering, uh, where things have to work in extreme corner cases. Um, and I think all the tools are there for the existing networks to get fixed. It's just a question of priority. At the investment that a 4G network costs, a single one, you can probably make the entire world use A53 and upgrade to secure SIM cards. So the money is there. It's just a question of priority that, that keeps the networks away from deploying these software patches. In the end, it's single lines of code. OK, we have another question in the, in the room from microphone number three. A uh, quick question for the tools that you're offering. Uh, can they work uh, with uh, some kind of passive recording device? For, uh, for example, can you collect data for the GSM map using the uh, Osmo SDR uh, tools? The ones that use the simple t uh, tuners, uh, DVB to T tuners to listen to the spectrum. Look, uh, you know Osmo SDR? Uh, yeah, I think that's more focused on being a BTS than a sniffer device, but I think you can use it as a sniffer device. Uh, it's just that then you need to process the data in a different way. Uh, really, the easiest is to, to use the Osmocom mobile phone, and it does this. And it's right. what we use for the live ISO. There are many models, actually. So, What would you consider the advantage of using an Osmo SDR? Uh, it's mostly because it, it doesn't require a phone or a SIM card or anything. It, uh, the question is, it can it work passively without, being, without sending anything? Yeah, yeah. yeah so the, the, the phone he just held up, that captures traffic with no SIM card and without connecting to a network. It does so passively by latching on to, to uh, a cell, passively, just hearing what, what's happening on the broadcast channel. And as soon as the, the, the cell starts communicating with another phone, it jumps to that frequency and also listens to the traffic. So that's already a passive setup. And the C139, I think it's the most available Osmocom phone, you still get that for $12 in, in China. So I don't think there's any reason to, to re-implement that for any other platform if there's already a $12 solution. Thank you. OK, and we take another question from the internet. <laughs> yeah, actually, some people are complaining that they have no signal in this room. Um, could that be caused by you, or is the, uh, the range not that large? <laughs> Well, we, we add choices for signal. We don't take them away. So this is just an additional BTS. <laughs> OK, thank you. OK, are there any other questions? Now is the time to ask. Uh, if not, I ask you again for a warm round of applause for Carson and Luca. Thank you. Thank you.